We're joined today by um, Leopold Plotek on the occasion of his exhibition at Corkin Gallery, What Does the Song Hope For? Thanks for joining us, Leo. My pleasure. Um, so the title of this exhibition comes from um, the Auden poem, Orpheus. Could you tell us a little bit about um, how that title came to be? Well, uh, the, the title of the exhibition was a chance encounter. In other words, I, I hadn't intended to be looking for a title for the show as such. I was searching for something else altogether. I was in fact looking for an Auden poem, but not that one. And uh, not finding it, I happened to stub my toe on Orpheus just entirely by chance, read the line, and realized that it was in some ways a perfect introduction to what I hoped the exhibition would accomplish. And uh, I, let me try to put this as succinctly as I can. The, for me, the key word in that line is song. Um, it's the song that's doing the hoping. It's not the singer, you know. It's not the poet who's in charge at that point. It's, it's the work of art itself that carries the hope, which is a hope of what? It's a hope of enlightenment. It's a hope of uh, some deep experience, some communion, um, and, that, and that the work of art itself carries that. We know, we know this in part because most of the works of art that to which we're devoted are historical. They were created by people who have long since left the world, whom we will never meet and never know. And what we're left with is the work they have left behind, the work that uh, resulted from their devotion and from their care and from, their, uh, and from the work of their imagination and from their hopes. But whatever is left of that is carried by the object itself. It's carried by the music, it's carried by the poem, by the words of the poem, it's carried by the colors of the painting and the structure of it. Um, and I, you know, I think that this is perhaps mm, increasingly forgotten today when we're more and more curious about artists and their personalities and their foibles and less and less concentrated on works themselves. And you know, what I hope for is that, because I won't be here with the exhibition every day, that a visitor can walk in and have a real experience uh, with every one of these works, uh, whichever one calls to them personally most strongly, you know? Because I think if the work is working, it will extend an invitation for the viewer to stop and, and to devote some minutes of their life to contemplating the thing that they're looking at, and then the work will have to extend its hope and do the work for me, as it were. I think that's probably why I made the choice. I made it at the last second before uh, sending my, my list of works uh, to Jane, um, uh, and I appended uh, that title, and I think it's a good one. Absolutely. A lot of your works are kind of inspired by music, literature, architecture, um, yeah. and a lot of the titles kind of hint at those kind of su subjects and yeah. precedents. Um, could you speak to a little bit about how certain works in this exhibition um, are inspired by those? Sure, practices? sure. It's, it's, you know, it's not a, it, it can't be a coincidence that in a selection of 11 pieces, four can be identified with painters, one with a sculptor, one with an architect, one with a comedian, <laughs> you know, and one with a musician. It's not an accident. I, I live with these people, most of them dead, you know, in my mind, in my studio every day. They're my constant companions. They are, they encourage me, they chastise me. I compete with them. <laughs> I, I relax with them. Um, so it's really not that surprising. Um, most of the time, painting titles don't necessarily cha channel the identity of the of the uh, of the predecessor uh, who might have inspired them. But in this case, they just happen to, and uh, you know, I'm not embarrassed about that. These are these are among the hundreds of artists uh, and literary and musical types, you know, that I'm that I'm uh, con whose work I'm constantly consuming and sustained by, so um, it's not a surprise, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think if I, if I look back over the last half dozen exhibitions I've had, uh, there's an area one that hasn't had 
the work of uh, a work of architecture somehow prominent in it. Uh, in this show, um, there's a painting uh, which was inspired by St. George's Church in, in Bloomsbury in, in London, a church I used to go by and occasionally drop into when I was a graduate student. I became quite obsessed with the work of Nicholas Hawksmoor, who was a, an 18th century architect and who built many beautiful churches in London, neoclassical buildings of really fine, fine quality. And, uh, you know, I visited perhaps eight or nine or ten of them over the years, and uh, St. George's is a, a particularly favorite one. Um, the, the painting itself actually began with a, a little drawing of a detail from the back of the church where the plumbing was, you know, not the sort of impressive uh, uh, front with the pediment and everything, right. which is what most people will, will look at in the postcard, but at the back of the, of the building itself where, uh, where the uh, uh, lead pipes were, you know, came down uh, carrying the effluence from, from, um, from the roof. Uh, I, think, I think that the painting in some ways reflects the seriousness of Hawksmoor's work, its kind of classical stability, its uh, meditative quality. I, you know, I like the painting a lot, and uh, it's not the first one of, of his work that I've done, but it's, I think it's the best one. Um, the picture next to it is, uh, is called Paul Clay at the Aerodrome. Paul Clay is a favorite painter of mine. Again, somebody not, not given perhaps as much attention to these days as he deserves, uh, although we had a very beautiful exhibition in, in Ottawa uh, not two years ago of, of um, Paul Clay's work. Um, in the First World War, like many German uh, artists, he was drafted and um, German-Swiss in his case. Uh, he was drafted and fortunately for him, rather than being sent off to the trenches, he ended up at an aerodrome uh, where young flyers were learning to master their, um, their fighter plane skills. And so he survived the First World War without, uh, without coming out of it with PTSD. And uh, fortunately for him and for us, um, the painting again started, and, and this is something fairly important with almost all of these paintings, that frequently they start out in the search of one thing and find another. So in the same way that I stumbled into Orpheus while I was looking for another poem altogether, um, the paintings often begin inspired by something or moved by something or even determined to portray something quite else than what they come up with. And, yeah. and there are two um, paintings in this exhibition together who yeah. um, you kind of noticed um, have an interesting conversation with it's each other, true. not having seen them kind of in the same context before. That's right. And that's, that's Tashkent right. and the um, Pacabia collage. Yeah. Um, could you speak a little bit about how sure. seeing those paintings together has changed the way you've thought about them or the conversation sure. between them? Sure. There, uh, f first of all, I, I should say that the, the Picabia collage uh, refers, of course, to the, to the great uh, French surrealist Francis Picabia, who is a particular favorite of mine and who had a strange and quirky sense of humor, which I hope that painting still possesses on my own behalf, <laughs> which is why I named it after him. Uh, the other one, which is called Tashkent, uh, is the name of um, an, uh, a city in the eastern, in the e far eastern regions of what used to be called the Soviet Union, um, the country uh, in which I was born in 1948. Uh, and near to where my parents spent most of the F Second World War and thus survived uh, the Holocaust when uh, the rest of their families stayed behind in Poland and in Russia and perished. Um, so Tashkent's always had this kind of magical, uh, you know, Near Eastern sound to me. It's a very beautiful city of which, of which I've only seen photographs. Uh, and, it, and you know, and to me, it's associated with, you know, the the adventure of my parents' survival. You know, um, the I think the reason why it got the painting got tagged with that name is that while I was working on it, I kept feeling echoes of Gorky, of 
Varshil Gorky, the American, or the American Armenian artist, um, uh, uh, who's a great favorite of mine and, and uh, wh whose work I know uh, reasonably well, and uh, perhaps my favorite of the American of that generation of American uh, abstract expressionists, which is a misnomer for him in any case. He's something much closer to an abstract surrealist than that. And, uh, and I, you know, uh, he was in my mind the whole time I was working on the painting. And I associated it with his abstractions, which were called Garden in Sochi, which referred to his mother. And uh, three or four really unusual paintings that he did reasonably early in his mature period. And uh, they're just beautiful paintings. And they have, uh, as a main motif, in the center of them, something that looks like a wooden shoe. And it may in fact be a shoe, for all I know. Um, it may, and perhaps that shoe was associated with his mother, I don't know. Uh, at any rate, the paintings were associated with his mother, and Tashkent was associated with mine, and so I thought I would just tag the painting with that name. The queer thing that happens is that those two paintings never came close to each other physically in the studio. They were hanging in opposite ends of a very big, you know, 2,000 square foot space. And uh, here in the gallery, they suddenly came side by side like a pair of weird twins. And I was saying to Jane that one of them is a kind of a soft and hairy thing full of what, I mean, it looks as if it's made out of caterpillars. And the other one is a sharp and crisp and clear thing as if it's, you know, comes from uh, a beautiful, you know, Dresden porcelain factory or something. And they're, they're about as unlike as two paintings right. could possibly be, but they're not that far apart in time, you know. Um, the fact is that just as with subject matter, we don't really know when we're, where we're going until we get there. Also, the form of the painting, we don't really know until we get it. And I never started out to make a, a woozy, hairy painting in the first place, but that's what I got right. from that. And I never set out to make a sharp, clear porcelain painting with the other one, but that's, what it, that's where it went. And honestly, I think if you're really true to what you're doing and you're really fully concentrating, you got to go where it leads. And you may not know where that is, you know, but it will determine both the subject and the form of the painting in the end. And uh, all you can do is say, that's what I experienced and put your name on it. That's the end of it, you know? And the, um, the Pacavia collage has a little bit of kind of mirroring and patterning and um, that's something that I kind of see in the um, beer and ocean work, which yeah. um, is inspired by a very patterned Mon uh, Mondrian. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that painting and kind of how these ideas of patterns and repetition may come into play in these works. Well, uh, here's, how, here's how that happened. First of, all, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about beer and ocean, which is meant to be a funny title. I hope most people find it at least amusing. Um, it's a play on words on a very well-known Mondrian uh, drawing slash painting. He did a number of them called Pier and Ocean, which were supposed to represent, you know, the sea off the beach of Scheveningen in, in Holland, looking at the waves playing, and which were represented by little horizontal dashes, and then the pier, which was represented by little vertical dashes going up the center of, of, the, um, of, of the construction. And uh, Mondrian was obviously, you know, he, he was obviously very, very intrigued by what he got from that first drawing because he repeated it and tried to paint it a number of times, I think mostly unsuccessfully. Um, I think very few of those pieces are actually finished. They're, for me, they're intensely beautiful. I've been looking at them since I was a teenager and I, I'm very attached to them. Um, Mondrian in general is an important figure for me. Um, at any rate, uh, Every once in a while, I try a Mondrian trick of some sort. Mm -hmm. And this particular time, I had that canvas, which is almost square. I think it's about four foot square. And I thought, why don't I just paint, why don't I paint my own version of Pier and Ocean? Mm -hmm. So I took a little brush and I started painting the little horizontal dashes. And I got about halfway into it. And, you know, it was summertime, it was hot. Maybe I was just bored with doing the job, you know. and. It just somehow turned on me. 
it, it just turned on me. Something weird happened in it, and before I knew it, I had this strange kind of blue mm -hmm. construction growing up in the middle of it, and it was something else altogether. And, um, and you know, you've got to give it its head. When it wants to go, you've got to go, you yeah. know? And uh, so, you know, two weeks later, the painting was finished, and it's, it's about as unlike a Mondrian as you can possibly imagine. And um, I thought, I have to give it a name. I have to give it maybe a Dutch name. So I thought, okay, beer and ocean, <laughs> which, is, which is, you know, uh, yeah. It's a play on Heineken, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. The Dutch and the, and the Mondrian. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, but, the two, but, but the other thing you asked me about was the mirroring and the repetitions in, in that painting. Um, I learned from... Uh, a very brilliant art historian named Amy Golden, <clears throat> who uh, wrote, lived and worked in New York uh, in the 60s primarily, and who was a very brilliant woman, with whom I had a, a, a very memorable afternoon one day in my studio in, in Montreal, and who handed to me her theory of the foundation of decorative art. And that theory concerned the creation of patterns, uh, their expansion into fields, and you can think of, you know, Islamic mosque decoration or uh, Turkish carpets or any one of the many other uh, decorative traditions that you can think of in the world. I've been using this principle in painting for, for many, many years. Frequently, if I, get in, if I get a sense that an area of a painting is beginning to dissolve or lose intensity or lose um, lose coherence, I'll, I'll work local symmetries into it. If I have a shape, I will produce uh, uh, a shape neighboring it that either, either mirrors it or doubles it or perhaps turns it on its head. Um, and, you know, by making these small local symmetries, you can actually pull uh, a chaotic part of a field together into something that's kind of coherent. So you'll see some of that in, in Picabia. One of the paintings that's more filled with kind of drama and emotion is the one right behind us, um, the Green Theater. Right. And um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what the story behind the Green Theater is. It's, you know, it's a very kind of theatrical, yeah. powerful work. Um, and I know there's a good story behind it, so yeah. you could talk a little bit about that. Many, many great mansions in Europe which had great gardens behind them, featured green theaters. These were, these were concoctions done by gardeners uh, to create a performance space for uh, a little chamber orchestra or a small opera to happen. If you travel through central Italy and you go to the, the great gardens, you'll often find these green theaters still there, you know? Anyway, Chekhov's play, The Seagull, and I'm a, a complete Chekhov fanatic myself, uh, and The Seagull is one of my favorite plays. In The Seagull, there is a green theater which is off stage, and we never really see it, but it's a place in which a play will take place, and in fact does take place during the play we're watching, in which the drama of a doomed love affair between a boy and a girl is reenacted symbolically, and we don't know this until it's over, uh, but it's a, it's a very moving thing. And uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to paint a green theater, not necessarily of Chekhov, uh, for quite some time. It makes me think of my daughter, who's a theater director and, you know, with whom I talk about Chekhov a great deal, frequently. He's, he's an, uh, an object of some uh, devotion for both of us. For sure. And talking about um, Chekhov and your daughter, yeah. um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about, um, you know, your, your personal family history. So you were um, yeah. born and your, most of your childhood was, was spent um, in Russia. Yes. Uh, born in Moscow, 1948, three years after the end of the war, which, as I said, my parents survived by living out in uh, Uzbekistan. and. Um, uh, <clears throat> my father was with the Polish diplomatic service. He was stationed in Moscow. They were living in the Metropole Hotel when I was born uh, and only got an apartment because they had a baby. So um, they and I and 
our Russian nanny uh, moved into a, moved into an apartment. I scarcely remember these things at all. I've seen photographs of them and their colleagues, but you know it, it's it's too early for me to remember. Uh, and then he was <clears throat> my father was uh, recalled back to Poland. We moved to Warsaw. I abandoned my Russian, even though my, my parents tell me I was able to stand up on a chair and recite Pushkin to the, to, the, to the guests at the party from memory, which is kind of astonishing in a child of five, but there you go. And, uh, and um, so uh, we were in Warsaw, where, where I was a very, very happy schoolboy for the next uh, seven years. And uh, because of some political shenanigans that my father engaged in, uh, we had to leave. And uh, so we ended up in Canada, I at the age of 12. Uh, I learned my English that first summer in summer camp, uh, rather brutally but quickly. <laughs> I came back to Montreal speaking English about as well as I do now. Um, I'm lucky in that I have, I have a good ear, I can imitate, you know, Turkish or Cantonese for a couple of seconds very successfully. I grew up in a, a socialist milieu. It's been my political faith all my life, as pathetic as it may seem now. That pathos is still relieved by a great deal of hope. That's and that, the background. Yeah. In that history, um, it, it seems to still inform your work, or at oh, least yeah. the kind of ideas and oh, yeah. things that you think about, no, read. <coughs> absolutely. Yeah. If I have an obsession in my subject matters, uh, Soviet history seems to be yeah. at the center of it. If you were an important Soviet artist, Stalin was going to enter into your life because he was the most important critic of literature, cinema, opera, really? wow. <laughs> you know, uh, every art form. And uh, as I was saying to someone in conversation the other day, not altogether a stupid critic. Uh, a man with some very limited sort of middle-classish uh, tastes um, and who wanted to be loved by his artists and wanted to be sincerely loved which is very difficult to do you know, with a man who could have you disappeared by tomorrow. Um, and so, 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 you know, there was this checkered relationship between Soviet filmmakers and poets and, you know, painters and sculptors and uh, Uncle Joe, you know. So I've painted a few of these and uh, I'll probably continue from time to time to do that. I, I came into this world in 1948, which is one of the worst years for a Jew to be born in, in the Soviet Union. It was um, practically on the eve of the doctor's scandal and, you know, it was a tough, it was a tough time. Uh, probably lucky that we went off to Poland where this was a little less severe um, when we did. There are two more works that are, um, the starting off point of them are, yeah. are kind of objects that you've encountered. Uh, one yeah. being the x-ray of the Bernini sculpture and one oh, being yeah. the one influenced by the Egyptian cup. And I know we've talked a lot about, um, you know, how artists are kind of, you're kind of in invested in them and, and learn from them. Um, but if you could speak a little bit to how those objects kind of sometimes form <coughs> ideas in your mind that become these, these um, finished products. Sure. Well, I can tell you, uh, uh, let's, let's just start with uh, the x-ray of the angel. Um, on one of my, uh, one of the months that I spent in Rome, and I've spent a couple of periods where I, where I managed to be alone in Rome, usually in the winter time, and uh, one of the old museums in the city was is called the Dora Pamphili Museum, and at the time when I first encountered it, it was one of those Italian museums that no one could afford to kind of keep clean or properly staffed. It was a bit of a what the French call a bordel, sort of a mess, you know? And uh, among the things that they had in their collection were a bunch of Bernini terracotta uh, sculptures. Um, they were models for bigger things that were going to be carved by professional carvers. But Bernini did, did make the terracottas uh, on, on which most, almost all his works were finely based. And he had done a series of these angels that were about maybe 18 inches high, and um, in, you know, in attitudes of worship, etc. And they were very beautiful. And I, I didn't know much about terracotta. You know, what did I know about sculpture? Not very much. You know, but I love these angels. And then many years later, my son, who's a curator, 
sent me a catalog that somebody, I think the Dora Pamphili Museum, had done of these Bernini Bozzetti, they're called, these little sculptures, and they included x-rays of each one to show you what they were like inside because, of course, they were hollow and they were built on supports of iron, usually like a piece of pig iron and a little bit of wire, a bit of wood or whatever to hold up the terracotta clay while you were working on it. And it was so, I was very moved by this because suddenly you were inside the secret place never seen by a person before and would never be seen ever by a person again, except through the magic of the x-ray. And uh, I just fell in love with those photographs. So it's one of the very, very few times when I've been actually inspired by photography was these x-ray photographs of, um, of these angels. And I chose the one I liked best, and I just started free painting based on that. And what, what you see here is the result. It doesn't much look like an x-ray, it looks, does look somewhat like an angel kneeling, but, but uh, you know, surrounded by all the sort of drapery that, you know, that hangs off the little figure. Uh, it's one of those fuzzy, emotional, interesting, sort of slightly out of focus paintings that I really yeah. love to do. Uh, I was gonna say something about that. There's, you know, the, a good painter, if they're, if they're worth anything, has many, many different ways to put paint on a canvas, you know, including splotchy and ugly and beautiful and serene and fine and fuzzy and, you know, all sorts of ways. Just like a good pianist has many, many, many different ways to lay their fingers on the keys of a piano and attack the piece, whether it's, you know, a Brahms intermezzo or whether it's Chopin or whether it's a boogie woogie, you know? Uh, there are many, many ways to touch the piano, including, you know, if you're some pianist with your elbow, you know? Um, I, I deploy a lot of ways to paint, you know? And I mean, I have them as part of my repertory of how I work, you know, and, and I don't know which of them I'm going to use until they're called for. So when they're called for, I know this has got to become super fine now. It's got to be a beautiful freehand edge, or it's going to be really nice, but fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy right at the end here. And, you know, it's, I guess it's what you call craftsmanship, but I don't think it's just craftsmanship. Artists have their ways with the material, and I think that the good ones have a feeling for it and they have a feeling for how to treat it. And um, I think that's essential. And I think to feel that, you gotta be in the presence of the thing. The image will not do. A photograph of that thing will not get it across. I don't care how fine-grained it is. You gotta be standing in front of it, you with your body in motion, your head in motion, your eyes blinking, it, you know, sitting there on the wall or standing on a plinth, whatever it is, for you to walk around or smell it, the feeling of the room, the other people moving around, it's all part of the experience of being in the company of an object. And it has a pathos because it is slowly going to pieces, just like we are. It will one day disappear. Some works disappear very quickly <laughs> and some take a thousand years, but they will all go away, just as we will, you know. And there's a pathos to that, and it's part of their content, I think. It's part of their real content. And also the fact that they're one at a time, there's no other like them, is part of the content. I think hearing Callas sing Visidarte, which is different from, you know, Joan Sutherland or somebody else singing it, it's part of the content that this is, this comes from my lungs and my heart, you know? Uh, and it's unlike anyone else's, is part of what we're experiencing. I think it's like, crucially important. And I think that's what's so powerful about this exhibition is coming and being, you know, in the presence of these paintings. Each one has its own kind of world that you can yeah. kind of delve into. Um, and and that's why we're so honored to have you here well, and to be I'm, able to talk about your work in the I'm presence so of it. And so pleased to be able to do that. And, and uh, you know, I wish for the visitors to have a rich and interesting meal <laughs> with them out of this. Thank you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel.